You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider. And now, it's time for the show that breaks down the options market. From unusual activity alerts to market analysis, strategy overviews, listener questions, and much more. If it involves puts and calls, then our all-star panel will break it down. It's time to hit the option block with your host, Mark Longo from the Options Insider Media Group and co-hosts Uncle Mike Tussaw from RCM Asset Management, Andrew the Rock Lobster Joe Fanasi from OptionFit.com, and Mark the Greasy Meatball Sebastian from OptionFit.com. The Option Block is brought to you by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. And now, get ready to hit the option block. All right, everybody, that rocking bit of tunage means it is time to rock out once again with everyone's favorite bi-weekly option show. Yep, it's time for the option block. My name is Mark Longo from the aforementioned theoptionsinsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting, at least we hope so, the Options Insider radio network. A lot of fun stuff hitting that old network. Hopefully you guys are enjoying all of it, mainlining it all the second it comes out or at your leisure. We don't judge as long as you're listening. We like to have you. And, of course, send in those questions, those comments. We do indeed love to hear from you guys. You know who else likes to hear from you guys is my cast of colorful characters. Starting off, let's go, hmm, how should we do it today? Let's go in order of most tranquil to perhaps least. Let's see. So let's start off when we're talking seas of tranquility. You're talking the moon or you're talking this little provincial hamlet known as St. Charles, Illinois, where we are joined once again by the ever-lovable Uncle Mike Tussaw from St. Charles Wealth Management. Uncle Mike, welcome back to the program, sir. Always a pleasure to be here celebrating this fine day uh, of Christopher Columbus and uh, the discovery of the new world. Indeed, even though no one celebrates it anymore. So, <laughs> we don't even get the day off anymore. Man, when we, we used to have a day off, it was great. The markets were closed, dogs and cats living together. Everyone was happy. Now we've changed it all, and there's... Some ruling, apparently, you can't have a certain number. It's not a real holiday if the markets aren't closed, in my opinion. If the markets aren't closed, it's not a holiday. And unfortunately, they've, they've shifted this one to February, which means there's no day off in October. And, you know, the street could use a few more days off. Let's just, let's just glom together a reason. Call it what you will. Call it Discovery Day. Call it Indigenous People's Day. Call it Columbus if you want. I don't care. I don't judge. Just give, a, give the folks, give the people a nice day off. I think, I think we can all get behind that sentiment. More federal holidays rather than less. Let's have some government-mandated shutdowns, because otherwise we know in our productivity-mad American workplace here, there's no other way to really get these corporations to take a break. So a few days off here and there might not be the worst thing. Break, cut down on the heart attacks we have here, at the very least. Speaking of heart attacks, this guy, he's poised for one at any minute. 
Of course, I'm talking about the Rock Lobster himself, or I guess because the Last Emperor is here today. Maybe are you once again the Cold Lobster, Mister uh, Mister <laughs> Mister Andrew Giovinazzi of Option Pit Infamy? I, I guess you know uh, to make the Emperor happy, I must be a cold water lobster today. Is there a hot water lobster somewhere? Is is that a thing? You know, I don't, I don't know. I, I mean, I know don't they pull like some kind of rockster, rock lobster out of Vietnam? I think the Vietnamese eat lobster. Uh, isn't I'm not. Is that a warmer, warmer ocean there? I, to be honest, since I've never known and never grabbed a Vietnamese lobster, I would not know. So I guess at the end I, they're all hot water lobster, right? Because you're pulling them all the same steaming pots. <laughs> exactly. Eventually. <laughs> They all become hot <laughs> And speaking of The Last Emperor, we are joined once again by Mr. Vrandapulo, a.k.a. The Last Emperor, holding down the active trader hot seat over there from the land of Fidelity. Mr. Last Emperor, welcome back to the program. How go things now in the land of zero commission, sir? <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, big announcement. Um, you know, it, it definitely feels like the majority of the clients, at least, that we speak to uh, on the strategy desk, there are very frequent traders. This is definitely, uh, you know, great news for those guys uh, and gals. Um, you know, everything uh, seems to be uh, relatively slow and kind of a benign day. I was going to say, you know, the equity markets, the options markets don't get a break on Columbus Day. But I believe um, those guys... Uh, in the bond pits over in Chicago are still pretty old school. I think the, the bond uh, pits. God, are you sneeze today. and the bond guys have a day off. I can't <laughs> keep track of their ridiculous number of holidays over there. That was the only thing I was envious of <laughs> when I was trading was their their hours on the bond floor because they let's just say they make bankers' hours look like they're working hard. But we are here. We're hurt, working hard. We're hardly working though as we keep on rolling right on into the trading block. It's time to break down the latest topics, trades, and trends in the world of options. It's time for The Trading Block. All right, let's get to it on what, uh, what did the last emperor call it? A benign day. That's, that's a pretty that's a good way to describe it. There's a lot of gentle drifting in no real direction whatsoever going on out there. A lot of it's understandable. We're still trying to make sense of exactly what the heck this quote-unquote deal or not deal, or maybe we're close to a deal, maybe we're farther away than we thought. Hey, pump the brakes. Hey, get excited. A lot of that going on out there, back and forth there. So, of course, with all that kind of uncertainty, market really liked it towards the end of last week. It was rally-ho all towards the end of the week. Today, cooler, saner heads prevailing. Maybe some of them taking the, the bond trader's lead and, and heading out for greener pastures, not, not uh, trading today. Either way, the market's... Pretty quiet today, at least from a net movement perspective. We'll get to the volume in a little bit. Uh, the Dow is up slightly, less than a tenth of a percent. S&P off slightly about half a percent, half of a point oh five percent. Easy for me to say today. Half a percent would be something. That is not what's happening. And Nasdaq is pretty much unched on the day. Uh, gold up slightly. Crude actually coming off a little bit. WTI off a little bit, off over a point today, about a point and a quarter. So some stuff afoot out there. In WTI, 53 and a half, a little bit shy of that right now. So a little bit of downside out there. Yet again, can't really catch a break to the upside in WTI, at least not for too long. And that, that continues to be the case uh, today. Our old friend VIX relaxing yet again, shy of the 15 handle. It's about 14.95 or so, so right around 15. That puts it down about three points from our last show. Our old friend VIX also coming off of its highs of north of 100 recently, now back down to a comparatively calm 96 puts it down about four handles from last show our old friend vxx after spiking to nearly 27 last week now back down to 22 and a half so threatening that beloved downside that i know a lot of our audience loves so much and uh, let's see well if you hopefully hopefully you like yourselves some earnings and a lot of you want this season in your lives you love it you need it in your lives you'll be happy it's back and <laughs> we're back again hopefully you like banks because there's a lot of banks Popping off this week. Starting tomorrow, we've got J.P. Morgan Chase, City, Goldman, Wells Fargo, Charles Schwab, BlackRock, and uh, IB on the broker side. Just to name a few. Uh, you got Bank of America on Wednesday, PNC, U.S. Bank Corp, BNY Mellon, uh, Netflix, the little Widowmaker out there, and IBM on Wednesday as well. Thursday, you got Morgan Stanley, KeyBank, E-Trade, and Friday, a little sugary sweetness there with Coca-Cola, Mr. Mr. Buffett's favorite name out there, as well as Amex. The old American Express, not the trading, 
not the trading company, not the, not the trading floor, uh, and Citizens Financial. So if you like yourselves, some financials, our old buddies, allies there of OPR fame, they're popping off before the bell on Tuesday as well. So if you like yourselves, some financials, this is the week for you to go to town. Let's go back. Let's go back the opposite of the way we came. Let's start with The Last Emperor. Mr. Last Emperor, what are your, your hardcores doing? Now that, now that commissions have been waived, sir, they, it's, like, it's like waving a red flag in front of a bull. So they're off to the races for trading. So what are they lighting it up on this otherwise, as you put it, benign day, sir? Yeah, I mean, one, one comment. I was just you know looking at the uh, SPX premium going into the weekend. Um, we, we had a... 20 handle sell off into the close even though it was a very strong day on friday still there was a lot of bids still for premium for this week so i was looking at mondays wednesdays and fridays expiration so uh the you know the 14th 16th and the uh ams as well as the uh, the pm settled ones for spx i just can't believe you know how premium got absolutely decimated uh in in these short-term options Given the fact that we are flat, and I guess the expectations were, well, we might gap up or gap down uh, coming into the opening rotation this morning. But, uh, yeah, premium just got absolutely clobbered in those options. Uh, So that's something to keep in mind. It's a lesson for everyone um, to be aware. Uh, Hat off to uh, Mr. Uh, Andrew Giovanazzi, uh, you know, calling the fact that uh, this week, VIX is going to be either sub fifteen, right, or uh, north of uh, north of twenty five, and and here we are at fourteen spot eight six in the VIX. So and yet, you know he can't stick the landing on the crystal ball and ball views. I, I don't know what to make of that. You know, you give him a whole week, a whole week of range, he can do that, sure. But ask him, ask him for a nice uh, bullseye on crystal ball ball views. Uh, not so much. I'm just putting that out. I, I, I think <laughs> stick the landing when it matters when I actually have something on and it counts. So. Constantin, thanks for the call out. And yes, it was a good couple of days for me. Ah! <laughs> He's just trying to make up for calling you the cold water lobster. <laughs> uh, by the way, guys, I, I think the di- differentiating fact between cold water and warm water is that the cold water ones actually have those, uh, uh, you know, big crushers uh, on the front. I don't, I don't think the uh, the warm water Mediterranean lobsters have claws, so that. That probably speaks, uh, you know, volumes in and of itself of Look the type of creature. This is good stuff to know. Here. I know. Who knew? Bringing the facts <laughs> to the show. It's a new thing. Who, who knew the last emperor such a such an expert on lobsters and crustaceans and all things of the sea? There, impressive, sir. <laughs> Um, in regards to what Fidelity customers are trading now, the commissions are free on the equity side. Uh, a couple of uh, stocks that generally make the list. Number one spot is claimed by Apple. Uh, Today, Fidelity customers, for the first time that I've seen in a while, are actually pretty evenly split here, 50-50 on buys and sells. Uh, Apple did make a new all-time high, being the largest market cap company in the U.S. Um, And, you know, I I think it's the largest publicly traded company around the world uh, at, at this point. So, so far, on the relatively benign tape, there has been... Uh, a little bit of back and forth in Apple made a new all-time high, pulled back a little bit. Uh, right now, you know, trading um, at uh, this level of 236.50, I think we uh, spent a decent amount of time at that level uh, on Friday before we gave some of it up. But needless to say, you know, um, in, in my views, I, I think that the options markets uh, are not, you know, doing a whole heck of a lot of volume today. Uh, in Apple, 372,000 contracts traded, though. Uh, and, you know, in, in, in my opinion, we, we still have a few hours to go. It, it's got to be one of the more actively traded uh, uh, names, probably. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, the differentiating fact here, not just that we're setting a new 52-week high, and I've, I've discussed some of those levels from, you know, two years ago or so that we have to look back to. Uh, but what's interesting to me is you go back three three quarterly reports, so all the way back into April or so of uh, 2019. And what I'm noticing is that implied volatility, looking out 30 days, 30 days for expiration options, has been very flat. It's, it's been you know trading in this range of 
somewhere between 25 and on the high side of around 30. And that's where we are right now. So implied vol, uh, as of this moment, is around 29, looking out 30 days. So, you know, this kind of speaks to the to the view that, you know, it's not, again, not always that just because a stock is trending higher, uh, making higher highs and higher lows, it means that volatility necessarily gets absolutely decimated or names, you know, it does stay bid and it's warranted. Remember that, you know, we're looking for that magic number of 16 for an average uh, of, of a 1% move representing a one standard deviation up or down. Um, you know, when you, when you have implied vol at 30, markets are expecting the stock to move. So if you're looking at your uh, Apple position today and, you know, earlier in the day when it was setting a new all-time high and you were looking at your positions if you were in calls, for example, and you weren't really seeing much appreciation, that's why, right? The stock has to move by a significantly larger amount uh, than you would expect out of a movement from, from the S&P as an example, right? Volatility is double in that name. So beware uh, of that sort of setup. Now, uh, Tesla is the second name that, uh, you know, is back in the limelight, I would say. Uh, there has been, you know, a little bit of back and forth between different analysts on, on the street, uh, raising price targets, dropping them, uh, so forth and so on. But today, stock is up 3.65% at 256, 257 uh, as of this moment. And the last time we've seen these numbers were prior to the last earnings announcement, which was uh, end of end of July or so. So, you know, interesting name. Um, volatility has been, you know, relatively high in this name for a while. I know that the options markets are doing pretty close already to 90-day ADV here, 201,000 contracts. Um, so, you know, people are, people are busy in Tesla option pits today. Um, the third name, and this is the one that I'm going to spend just a little bit of time, you know, kind of extrapolating and talking about. You could have, you know, I could have probably done a small segment on the strategy block or the mail block, but I find this to be very important. I'll take a few moments uh, the third name that doesn't show up, I normally wouldn't even talk about a stock like this, but um, SES, uh, Synthesis Energy Systems Incorporated, is actually number two on the list of stocks traded by Fidelity customers, um, 55% buys to 45% sells, and the stock is up 217% today. So it's trading at $16.50 right now. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning this name, number one, is never heard of the company. Um, obviously, it is trading on some, you know, rumored news of a potential takeover. Uh, I am no, not going to speculate on whether or not it's going to happen. Um, I would leave that up to the, uh, to the analysts that are covering the stock. And I don't think any analysts are actually covering this particular name because of how small the company's market cap is. Um, I, I looked it up, I'll look into it a little bit. Um, it looks like it has a market cap uh, of seven or eight million bucks. Um, total of shares outstanding, 1.379 million. And I'm looking at the action on Friday when the stock was up, you know, hundreds of percent. And today, uh, Friday traded 33 million shares. And today, it traded 19 million shares. So this is the type of thing that right away, right, if you're an investor, if you're a trader, you should be asking yourself, is this one of these caveat emptor type situations where, you know, you definitely need to be aware or beware, uh, buyers beware, right? Uh, what am I really doing if it's, you know, 1.4 million outstanding shares and it's trading 30 million ton times? Who is really, you know, getting in and out of it? Why is it moving as much? Well, that's probably the reason why. Now, second part uh, to this, again, and I'm not speculating on where the stock is going to go from here. It obviously had a tremendous jump. But this morning, uh, we sit pretty close to the uh, to the trading uh, desk. And I heard some rumblings, uh, you know, of, of conversations or calls of people calling in saying, hey, I'm trying to trade some options on this thing. Why am I getting error messages on Fidelity Systems? Well, Fidelity has a rule to where if the only available options on an underlying are adjusted, 
then opening transactions um, cannot be placed on the web. So you have to call in and actually talk to a broker. Um, and the reason for that, right, is, is this specific situation. So I've looked it up. I'm looking at the option chain here. And SES traded today 396 contracts. Um, Nine-day average volume looks like what I'm getting is one. So nobody ever trades this stuff. Today, all of a sudden, the stock is on the move. And you get, you know, relatively decent volume. I look on the options chain. Um, what is available? Well, the only ones that are available are the October expirations and then uh, the leaps that go out to uh, 2021, and they're both adjusted. So first things first, if you are thinking about opening um, a trade, right, you got to look at this and say, what is going on? I see the two and a halfs and fives were very active, uh, and those are the only strikes that are available. I know that this is opening paper because open interest was 11 contracts on, on both two and a halfs and fives for October, zero on the put side. Um, in, in January, there was 22 contracts on two and a half calls. The rest was zero across the board, and today you're having you know volume showing up, so you know that at least some of it is most likely, definitely going to be opening paper. Um, you look at the adjustment. Go to OCC.com. You look at the adjustment. It's amazing, right? Reverse split, uh, one for eight back in July. So now you have a 13-share del deliverable, basically, in this contract. So you do simple math. And, you know, for those of you who are not aware, right, of how quickly you could uh, uh, figure out whether something is in the money or not, right, you just take... If it's 13 shares deliverable, 0.13 times the current price, it's basically, you know, relatively speaking, the stock is moving all over the place. But the last time I looked was trading at 13 and a half. So the, the strike at the money would be $1.75 and you're buying two and a half. So it's an equivalent of, you know, a stock would, would have to trade at 20 if you're trading two and a half or at 40 if you're trading fives in order for you to even break even. Um, so that that's primarily the reason, right? If, if you think that you figured out something that is basically free, I could pay 10 cents or 15 cents for two and a half or, you know, five cents for fives and stocks trading at 13, it's free money, <laughs> right? Well, it's not. There's no free lunch out there. Uh, something is, is definitely... Uh, messed up and and you know if if someone is allowed to place opening transactions without um, really understanding the underlying this is this is the risk i understand it's not huge dollars you know 400 contracts even if they paid you know 15 20 30 whatever cents on average for you know for all of these it's not that much money to be lost but still um, it should be reckoned with and this is just a great example of that scenario but that wraps it up for us, guys. I had a feeling something was afoot in that when I pulled it up while you were talking, and I saw the yeah, you're right. The two halves were trading for twenty cents, <laughs> and the stock is trading about sixteen sixty six right now. So clearly, clearly, some other game was afoot out there. So they got a little early taste of this of a strap lock there from the last emperor breaking down some some funky split adjustments and how that could impact your prices pretty clearly <laughs> somehow 400 or so people or 400 or so contracts managed to find their way onto the tape today but yeah last i was looking last last uh, friday it was only 10 and then one i think the day, the day before that the adb is one so not exactly a big option name not not exactly surprising it's been sitting at around 180 for the better part of at least this past year so not exactly a lot of options action on a name like that where there is options action though is a little quiet hamlet known as saint charles uncle mike sir what is lighting up your tape on this otherwise fairly sleepy day? I have to say, not a lot lighting up my tape today. Uh, it is a very sleepy day, as you had mentioned. Um, yeah, with everything that's going on, I think that um, uh, we are eagerly awaiting the earnings that are coming up. Uh, as you had mentioned, the banks that are going to be announcing. And uh, maybe it's a good day. It's a bank holiday today, so maybe the banks are taking a break before uh, their earnings announcement. Who knows? But... Um, Waiting that, and I think the other thing that we're waiting to see in this market is a little bit more clarity on what this deal actually was with China, uh, how it's going to have an impact. Is this the final say? Is this the, uh, just the first part of it? Uh, how is this going to affect it? Is this legitimate? Is this just some type of thing to where they put a bunch of stuff together and say, oh, we have a deal, and uh, 
the Democrats and Republicans argue over whether it's valid or not. What's going to happen with this? So I think that's another thing that the markets are waiting on, aside from the fact that it is Columbus Day today. Uh, and so this is very much a wait and see day to day. Uh, but the exciting part is, is that we have a lot to look forward to in these coming weeks. Uh, the other thing to mention is October. Uh, crazy things do happen in the market in October. There was a some that happened on October 19th a couple of years back. I, I keep forgetting what what the, what the name of it was. Um, uh, it was back in 87, I think. Something happened that day. I don't know. I keep forgetting. Uh, but we have a lot of things to look forward to, combined with the fact that this is traditionally a very unpredictable month. Uh, so not much happening right now, but uh, I think there will be in the next couple of weeks. There you go. If you're an Uncle Mike client, call him up, and you can make something happen right now. He's sitting there waiting for your call to do something. He's, he's twiddling his thumbs out there in St. Charles. You know, he's never twiddling his thumbs because he's always busy chasing off those, those clam poachers. Is the Rock Lobster. Mr. Rock Lobster, sir, what's lighting up your tape in this otherwise quiet and tranquil day, sir? Um, you know, I think it's a little, um, a little... We're in the anticlimactic zone, I feel like, <laughs> where... Um, we, you know, we have a we have a detente for what appears to be a couple of months or one month, maybe, depending on the next tweet. Um, uh, maybe Hong Kong slowed things down a little bit. Uh, the fact that, you know, the lights shining on China a little more than they would have liked. And now all of a sudden they got maybe too many problems they got to deal with. I'm not sure. Um, but either way, uh, it feels like there is a, a a rough detente. Let's put it that way. Um, so, uh, where do we go from there, or where do we go? You know, where do we go from this spot? Um, what am I looking at? I mean, we we're starting to get to uh, the low. You know, I would say a low tick for the last what three weeks for VIX, uh, from what I can tell. Um, The low end for the cycle tends to be around 13 until, you know, there's another tweet or something. I mean, now literally the market, since we don't have a trade deal, we just don't have trade hell. um, And we have what I would call a detente for a while. Um, The market doesn't seem to worry about the repo problem anymore. Um, Treasuries have come down a little, up a little bit today, but came down fine. So basically, you got a recipe for not a lot happening. Um, we have a lot of bank earnings coming out. I think that could be a, a, a mini catalyst, one way or the other, uh, at least from volatility, because that's mostly what I watch, you know, in the SPX. Um, and I think we just now at this point we have to wait for some earnings. You know how you know how is this trade deal slowed things down, slowed people down, um, and how how that all works out. So it's kind of a wait and see after a pretty active week last week. It was active last week. Not so active today. Let's break down what is lighting up our tapes out here today. Uh, VIX coming to Showtime had done a little bit north of a quarter million contracts. So that's actually not a bad day for VIX. It was lighter last week. Uh, SPY had hit about a million. That's a little less than a third of its ADV out there. SPX, a little bit over half a million. That's about a third of its ADV as well. Uh, the Q's at about 200,000. That's less than a third of its ADV. And the Russell at about 125,000. It's ADV right at close to about half a million. Uh, coming into today, the top 10 on the most actives out here. It's uh, it's pretty much only takes 64K to break into the top of the list today, listeners. That shows you kind of what we're dealing with today in terms of of what exactly is active or perhaps maybe not so much out there. And 64,000 is Amazon. That gets you into the top 10 listeners, followed hotly, closely by Netflix, 65,000. That'll get you onto the list there in good old uh, Netflix. Then number eight, good old telephone, 68,000. You can see a trend there. Number seven, Baba, 75K. Number six, Facebook, 79,000. Number five, Microsoft with 80K on the tape. Number four, Bank of America, 85,000. Number three, AMD, perennial top three or back in the top three again, nearly 200K on the tape. Number two, the aforementioned Tesla. Last Emperor said your Fidelity folks are liking it, and the market as a whole liking it. 201,000 contracts on the tape. And number one with a bullet, 
Constantine spoiled it for us. Not exactly a big spoiler, though. I think you can pretty much guess guess it most days, and you would be right. Yep, it's Apple yet again. Nearly 400,000 contracts on the tape today, so pretty active day. Interestingly enough, both t- Apple and Tesla are exactly 50-50 called the puts today, which is kind of weird. You don't see that too often. The most biased paper seems to be AMD with about 71% of that flow coming on the call side of the ledger. Uh, speaking of flow, let's see what flow caught our eye of Sauron today with a little bit of the old odd block. It's time to break down the most interesting, unusual, and downright questionable options activity that's been identified by theoptionsinsider.com. It's time for the odd block. Everybody, welcome to the Odd Block. Going to keep uh, keep the motor running a little bit here today, actually, because we were kind of there wasn't a lot coming into Showtime that really caught our eyes. So we had our Eye of Sauron continuously scanning as we were doing our last segment, actually, and actually picked up a couple. So maybe we'll just we'll throw those into the mix as well here, and uh, just to make the Rock Lobster's life even more even more difficult and or exciting. So we're going to kick things off. If that other name we were just talking about there earlier didn't get your boat floated for crazy, weird, funky names, you got a biotech or a pharma to throw in there for you. Alexion Pharmaceuticals, ticker symbol ALXN, going to kick us off here with, uh, let's see, trading today, 102.15, so that puts it up about 3 bucks or nearly 3%. This is the name over the past year. This chart looks like a biotech stock. It's up, then it's down, then it's up again. A year ago, it was trading 127 then it sold off down to about 93, 94 back in, of course, Christmas Eve. Then it rallied back up pretty firm, back up to about 140 and change back in early April. Sold off again to about 113 in May, end of May, back up to about 135 in July, and then sold off again down to about 95 or so back in early September. And then it kind of rallied again up to about 110, and then it's kind of slowed, sold off down to where it is right now, till today anyway. Uh, coming into today was 94, 95 again um, last week. Uh, so it has rallied a little bit over the last week, up about seven handles or so. But overall, it's been a topsy-turvy year for Alexion, as you would expect, with, uh, with the biotech name. And what do we see? What our eye of Sauron just spit at us moments ago? So it's fresh, hot off the tape, listeners. We've got the Nov 105s. <laughs> we have a couple names coming in. We'll get to Appa in a second. I'm, I'm letting the cat out of the bag here. But we saw in Alexian were the Nov 105s uh, going up third, about 3,500 times for three and a half bucks. This market also suitably wide for a pretty li- liquid name. They were three bucks at three and a half. Someone gobbling those bad boys up for three and a half bucks. Opening over there on the SIBO. Worth noting, they do have earnings on the 23rd. Of October, so coming up in a little over a week or so here. So interesting, interesting here on Alexian. So Mr. Rock Lobster, let's kick it off here as I just broke down all the year that's been up. It's been down. It's been up. Someone uh, going to a heck of a lot of trouble and expense to wager it. It seems like again on the upside, sir. And they got a little bit of earnings love with them as well. What's your what's your feel on these these pretty meaty upside calls here in Alexian? I'm trying to. I'm. This is a like a big drug. So I know this is kind of like a favorite of people, right? It's like a. It's a momentum moves a lot. You know, chart stock. You know, it, it has it has followers. Um, uh, I don't know. They have a drug coming out. It, it, the ball's not high enough for that. I think just like. A, it just feels like a vanilla. I just want to buy some calls and get long because we don't have a trade deal, and you know, and the stock is kind of poised to do something. You know, it's at the bottom of its range. It was one forty. Um, you know, the whole bio, the whole pharma thing is. I think it's kind of like I don't know what what section is in worse shape: the oil sector or the or the pharmaceuticals. Just getting. Knock down the multiples, like the multiple on this, this is like an other one where it's, what, a, f- a five, a ten, ten times earnings or something. Um, so I, I think it's an, it, it looks like an inexpensive, you know, uh, biotech pharma stock. And 
It's just somebody wants to get long and have some leverage. They're looking for, you know, 10 bucks or more on this. So somebody's looking for a big pounce, which certainly could happen. By oil, would you perhaps be referring to perhaps hydrocarbon exploration? Because if that's the case, sir, then I got you covered here with our next name. This is the one that's hot off the presses, just going up a few minutes ago. This is in our old friend Apache. No, not on the website. No, this is Apache Corporation, ticker symbol APA, which is engaged in the aforementioned hydrocarbon exploration. I've said it before. I love, I love the companies that have that as their, as their description. It just sounds so, so glorious and glamorous. <laughs> for, instead of, yeah, we dig for oil and LNG. That doesn't sound quite as cool. Uh, let's see here. Over the year, I said 2208 today, up about two-thirds of a buck or about 3%. Over the course of the past year, uh, it's been mostly downside in this name. It's trading about 44 and a half a year ago, so pretty much double what it is right now. Sold off pretty hard back around Christmas Eve down to pretty much close to where it is right now, 25 and a half or so. And then it rallied back up, back up by April, got up to about 36 and a half again. And then it kind of came right back down again by the course of August. It was trading actually below where it is right now. It was trading 20 and change. And then it kind of spiked back up to 20, actually 28 and a half in mid-September. So obviously a lot of that having to do with probably some of the, uh, shall we say, tumult going on out there. In, in, in certain parts of the globe that have to do with oil and hydrocarbon production. And then that, kind of, that spike was short-lived, and it kind of came right back off again, down to 20 again very quickly. And now it's up back to about 22 and change. And what came across our radar just a, a few minutes ago, the Dece 25s going up for 60 cents. These are 54 at 61. Again, a weird market. 12,500 times, total of over 20,000. Going up on the day today, Mr. Rock Lobsters. This is some pretty decent size for this name. This is all opening, obviously. There are earnings coming up on the 30th of October, so there are earnings baked into this, even though this seems to be a little bit beyond just an earnings play. Uh, and, uh, yeah, a lot of paper gobbling up some upside, Mr. Rock Lobsters, at the tune of 20000 of the 25s. It's, uh, it's a few bucks out of the money now, but it has been north of 25 multiple times this year, and just a year ago it was almost double where it is right now, so... 25 is not exactly a crazy bridge. Mr. Rock Lobster, you were talking about just how beat up the uh, the oil and indeed the hydrocarbon exploration segment is. What's your spidey sense telling you about these 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 25s for size here in Apache? Yeah, it, interesting that, you know, we had just talked about this the day. Did we have Inconacorp, uh, which I still think is... Yes. Uh, like, also engaged in hydrocarbon exploration. Yeah, it's it's... Um, it just, it feels like, uh, you know, market's still kind of at highs, oil, XOP, if you look at XOP, uh, and I, what is, uh, uh, Tucson loves XLE, just, they're, they're sitting around producing dividends, but not really, you know, doing much as far as a, uh, you know, as far as, you know, underlying prices go. I mean, look at, look at the year in this thing from since January, I don't know, probably down seven or eight bucks. Um, and I'll even take a look at the XLE. How's that same thing? Like, again, like trading right around the, the bottom-ish of the range. Um, I don't know if this has to do with climate change or people selling, you know, companies or stocks that are not, um, um, you know, copacetic with <laughs> their climate thoughts. But either way, as a sector um, – Oil and gas, and maybe it's just from overproduction, I don't know, or just that we produce so much, but um, it, it feels like a bottom fishing trade. You know, somebody's looking for a little pop here into the end of the year for sure. The calls aren't that expensive, um, and it would not surprise me to see some consolidation in this industry, by the way. That would not be a big shock um, where everything is at this point because, you know – it just there there's there's earnings there there's growth but there's just no uh just these stocks have just you know they've died as far as any kind of uh you know appreciation goes which is probably the best time to buy them usually yeah you know this one <laughs> this one you know we, we've seen a lot of crazy flyers in the hydrocarbon exploration space of like this one not exactly the most crazy reasonable 60 cents out to dece not that far out of the money it's a it's a more reasonable flyer i think we could i think we could term it tell you what we will put this in the category of, of to be watched. And we shall return to our friends APA and see how they feared that they made money, lost money, just like we're going to do right now with our last name. Our old friends, Mr. Rocklops, remember our days of the, the infamy of the men's warehouse trade. 
Uh, well, we profiled a little over a month ago, uh, mo- September 9th to be precise. We profiled a trade in their parent company, Taylor Brand. Or, excuse me, Tailored. Past tense. Tailored Brands, Inc. Ticker symbol TLRD. This is an interesting one. At the time, back on the 9th of September, we profiled Size. Size put Palooza going up out there to the tune of the SEP 7s. SEP 7 puts were going up for a buck 70, 12,000 times opening on the Philly. As the day went on, a total of 22,000 of these contracts went up. This is not a name that puts up a lot of paper, listeners. So that was a lot of paper. Uh, and, yeah, that bumped up the OI to pretty much 22,000 contracts after that day. So a lot of opening paper on this strike. On the day that went up, the stock closed at $6.19. So it was an interesting choice already there. They were buying effectively already in the money puts and paying a pretty hefty premium to do so. Buck seventy. That's a lot to pay for those puts. And it seemed like an interesting choice for a lot of reasons because almost immediately after that trade went up in the next couple of sessions, the stock took off to the north and went up over 7 bucks. And it seemed like, oh, this thing's going up the other way. And then almost immediately after that, a few sessions later, it sold back off again. And within a week or so of this trade, it was the stock was back under 5 bucks. And in fact, when this, these stocks, these options went out, which was on expiration there in September, stock closed at four dollars and eighteen cents. So these puts not quite three bucks, but close to it there in the money. Also, interestingly, a lot of interesting things with this trade. Uh, these puts were still open as of expiration, so there were about twenty two thousand, twenty one thousand seven hundred and forty, to be precise, were open on expiration day. So, Mister Rock Lobster, our friend here, decided right before the stock popped to buy a whole boatload of deep-in-the-money puts and pay through the nose for that privilege. He paid nearly two bucks for these things. Uh, And then it seemed like for a while there it could have been all right, and then it sold off, and then these puts were looking good, and then he never never closed it out. So there's a lot to unpack here. I mean, if this guy really wanted to dump the stock at 7, he could have done it in the marketplace a day or two after and not paid nearly two bucks for the privilege. Uh, so yeah, this was a weird one all along, Mr. Mr. Rockloss. So what do you think is happening in our old friend out here? Once again, Tailored Brands, AKA Men's Warehouse, our old nemesis, sir. All right. Well, this name clearly continues to confuse and befuddle us is what it looks like. Um, <laughs> cause we're like paying all that juice for those puts at the seven handle. Um, again, it doesn't mean things can't work. It just, <laughs> Uh, a little odd um, on how, and you know, what do they do? Buy puts in stock, even if they did, the whole thing is just. Uh, yeah, it, even if they did it with stock, it still sucks. <laughs> it just it's a it's a total ball of confusion on this one, and I don't really. I there must be something behind the scenes <laughs> that we don't see because I mean, ultimately, they bought the puts for two bucks, and it looks like they made money on them, right? It's, I mean. Seems that way. It seems that way, and I maybe they just were like, okay, or they have an underlying position that you're like, okay, this is my line in the sand, and if the stock goes below this level, I'm just going to have my stock called away, which is clearly at the bottom of the range. So I guess Men's Warehouse is trading at a even bigger discount. They should have never got rid of that spokesman guy. Yeah, they, they should never got rid of that beard guy. He was, he was clearly he was good. half the premium of this name. Yeah, if I'm the fund manager or if I'm whatever executive that has someone managing my stock portfolio for me, and this is how they choose to hedge it, I think I'm giving that guy a phone call and being like, what, what are we doing here? <laughs> what is happening? <laughs> I guess you could be charitable and read this. This guy did it one-to-one with stock. He immediately dumped the stock at the high the next couple of days later. So he's making money on the stock already. So the rest is just gravy, right? He didn't need, right. to, he didn't need to profit on his paltry options. <laughs> That's, that's probably the most charitable way you could read this because pretty much any way that this guy needed to get short stock, which he clearly did because that's what happened, um, or dump some. He could have done it a lot easier and cheaper by hitting the bid in the, in the market a day or two after this trade. So, yeah, this is – once again, you're right. Once again, Men's Warehouse continues to just uh, be our nemesis here. And yeah, let's hope – Saner, cooler heads can prevail. But we can always count on Uncle Mike for such things as we keep on rolling right on into the strategy block. 
It's time to dispense options, wit, wisdom, and education. It's time for the strategy block. All right. Mr. Uncle Mike, sir, we've been all over the place on today's show. We've been hot water lobsters, cold water lobsters, befuddling men's warehouse trades, crazy biotechs, uh, crazy split adjustments in, in other names. <laughs> a lot of weirdness on an otherwise quiet day. So we like to look to you for calm, for serenity, to clear our minds with some strategy and or education. So what do you got in store for us today, Mr. Uncle Mike? I want to go through the importance of keeping some money on the sidelines or not feeling like you have to be using all of your money at one point in time. We had a client a couple of years ago that would get mad at one of our other brokers. Uh, this is back in the days when we were brokers, but uh, uh, he would get mad at him if he would go a day or two without suggesting a trade to him. Now, keep in mind, the other broker did not have motivation to do such a thing because if you didn't, in the commission era of things, if you don't have clients don't trade, you don't eat. Uh, but with that being said, the broker that we had working with us at the time, he was a very honorable man, did very uh, was very good at what he did. Um, it was he wouldn't recommend a trade because he would know, see the big picture to say if he would recommend a trade and if it didn't work out, then eventually he's not going to have any clients anyway. So with that, the client would constantly call him and harass him, not in too bad of a way, but constantly be frustrated because he would say, I, what can I trade today? There's got to be something out there to trade. And so finally the broker said to him, <clears throat> oh, well, just because you live in Aspen doesn't mean you go skiing every day. Just because you uh, live on a lake doesn't mean you go fishing every day. And just because you have a trading account doesn't mean you necessarily have to trade every day. So here's where I'm going with this. I've had clients before as well uh, that have kind of had that mentality uh, since I've pretty much been in the fee-based side of this business since I've been independent over 10 years ago. I haven't had too many people saying, come on, you got to trade something. I haven't really had that issue. Um, but I have had clients want to do a condor when a one-legged short vertical would have been appropriate. So in other words, let's say that you are bullish on XYZ stock and you sell a vertical put spread against it. Um, and it's out of the money, you want to collect premium, but you're still a little bit bullish. If you have the mentality that, well, I can make this into a condor with no extra uh, margin or, or no extra maintenance requirements, which you can at pretty much any broker, uh, doesn't mean just because you can doesn't necessarily mean you should. I'm sure Andrew said that at some point in time. It sounds like something Andrew would say. But where I'm going with this is that I've seen clients do that, and just because they can and they feel, well, I can also get some more premium out of doing this, and then all of a sudden they were correct in being bullish on the stock, but because they wanted to turn their trade into a condor just because they can, it's often hurt them because the stock goes higher and they end up losing money on the bear call spread. So the first moral of today's lesson of what I want to go through is the fact that if you are selling a put spread because you're bullish neutral, so to speak, meaning you don't think the stock's going to go to the high heavens, but you think it's going to go higher and you want to collect some premium, let's say, doesn't necessarily mean you need to turn it into a condor just because you're getting the uh, free maintenance ability to do so. So that's the first thing that I want to emphasize, because if you do that, you're taking away deltas and you're creating something that goes against what your initial sentiment actually was. Second part about this, and this I actually have had some clients get on me about. Let's say that uh, I'm just going to use a random example. Let's say a client has a $3,000 trading account. And if you're I, I've had it to where I'm bullish on XYZ stock or SPY typically and uh, I sell a put spread or buy a call spread or do a diagonal, whatever I'm doing, and the actual risk that's in the account is, let's say, maybe five, $700, something like that, and I have $2,300 on the sidelines, let's say. Well, oftentimes, I shouldn't say too often anymore, but in my earlier years, clients would say, well, you have all this money sitting in cash. If you really believe in the trade, why don't you put more money into it? Uh, why, I'm not, why, am I, uh, not, why do I not have more money into it? Well, what I would say is that you need money on the sidelines for two purposes. Purpose number one, in case you need to adjust or um, need to roll a call or something along those lines, uh, whether a trade's going for you or against you, you need to have a little bit of money available for things like that. But the second reason is, and this is kind of a foreign concept to a lot of beginners, is that you might lose. 
So let's say that I didn't do well on that trade and I ended up losing money on it. Well, I like to have some money left over for a rainy day for the next day. Sometimes you'll see people advertise their auto-execute services or things like that that'll say, I made 400% on this one trade. Well, that's fine, but did you have your whole account in it? Well, hopefully not. And they might not be lying, saying they made 400% on a trade, but you need to kind of look at the big picture, saying, how much did your account make over the course of a one, three, five, and 10-year period? And that can give you a more accurate reading on how good or bad the service is. So the thing that I want to emphasize today is that leave a little bit in cash for reasons that you may have to make an adjustment or you might actually lose a trade. And the second part of it, just because you can, doesn't necessarily mean that you should. Well, we should, at the very least, continue on into our final segment. It is time to go around the block. It's time to tell you what we'll be watching on our trading screens until the next episode. It's time for Around the Block. All right, everybody. Welcome to Around the Block. Tell you what we're watching for the rest of this week until we can gather here together again on Thursday. I already detailed the litany of earnings coming out. Let's just condense it to one sentence. I hope you like banks because there's a lot of them popping off this week. Let's go back to The Last Emperor. Let's start there. Mr. Last Emperor, sir, what is on your radar for the rest of this week? Yeah, guys, uh, you know, Uncle Mike, thank you so much, by the way, for uh, for your lesson. I, I uh, studied this pretty pretty closely um, in, uh, in my MBA program as well as while we were studying for our CMT designations, kind of that, that laws aversion cognitive bias for sure people willing to lose uh smaller amounts of money as you know poll um just you know throw it away well three grand is not that much versus you know when you're dealing with larger amounts of money kind of take a a, a different stance and it really should be all the same um what i'm watching for uh the remainder of the week this week um a few earnings announcements uh, i think netflix is going to be interesting uh, you, you saw some some activity in the option pits today, and they're um, relatively active on the benign tape. Um, Netflix definitely has been struggling. There are, there have been a lot of cuts uh, to price targets by a lot of uh, analysts out there, so sentiment is fairly low. Uh, we'll see how it does. I'm sure that the Stratos is pricing in a pretty decent amount for a move in that name. I'm watching J.P. Morgan. I'm also watching... The big uh, insurer, um, health insurance giant, the uh, uh, United Health uh, Corporation as well. And then uh, retail sales from the uh, fundamental kind of macroeconomic side of things. Um, the uh, consumer has continued to uh, be the, you know, the, the, the light, I guess, the torch, right, in our economic uh, expansion here in the U.S. So we uh, hope that, that continues into the future. So uh, going to be looking for that on Wednesday. And Mr. Rock Lobster, sir, what is on your radar for the rest of the week? Well, we've got, besides earnings, we have how low can the ball go? Um, can we see 14 tomorrow? Um, everybody just like, all right, we got to keep this bid. You know, now it's one of the things without news on the cycle, it's how high can we keep the bid? Wouldn't surprise me if we see a 14, like a low 14s tomorrow into settlement. Um, and we wait till earnings come out. By the end of the week, we could see an extremely low VIX, like 13, because of, um, real simply, because of uh, the bank earnings are pretty good. I mean, we don't have to deal with negative interest rates. Actually, we have, I have students in Europe, like, um, banks are charging people to deposit money. Like, I don't know how that madness is going to go on where people just stop putting their money in banks and what? Keeping it under their mattress? I don't... <laughs> it, it still kind of boggles my mind that it has gone on this long. So um, it would not surprise me to see it continue to go on. Um, so anyway, um, that's where – that is a long-term thing. But short-term, I think we could see some decent earnings here from banks. And we'll see how you know corporate earnings have stood up to the, uh, you know, to the trade uncertainty. And we're going to know that into this week and then into next week because obviously people not borrowing money are worried. So if bank earnings are pretty good. I, that should usually bodes well for the earnings cycle uh, going forward. 
over under on what percentage of names of this this cycle blame the trade war in some way, shape, or form for whatever whatever is <laughs> befalling them. their company. I'm going to say put the over under at fifty percent. I'm going to take over because yeah. it's, <laughs> yeah, too easy. Easy. it's too easy. It's too easy. It's too. My favorite still to this day is when Sibo back in the day blamed the VIX futures term structure for their poor performance. And that might be my favorite excuse I've ever heard from a company out there. All right, last but not least, Uncle Mike, sir, what is on your radar for the rest of the week? Well, first off, big thank you to the emperor for the kind words. Um, and just for what I'm looking at this week, I think that, uh, uh, like Andrew said, the banks are definitely going to play a factor. And just uh, the only thing I would add to what's already been said is that uh, we are approaching the anniversary of uh, Black Friday uh, from back in 87, of course. I referred to it a little bit earlier uh, for those of you that didn't catch it. And so uh, you never know on days like that. It's something that uh, most people are still thinking about when they go to the, go to trade that day. So um, I'm typically not much of a calendar analysis type of person, but uh, definitely watching. And uh, if anything, there'll be some good special stories on uh, the news media about it that will be interesting. Unfortunately, that's all we have time for on this very interesting episode of the Option Block. But before we go, let's go back around the horn one more time, check in with everybody, see what they have cooking. That may interest you beyond just when we're talking here on this show. Let's start. Let's start. Let's go back to the way we came. Let's start with Uncle Mike, sir. Uncle Mike, if folks are intrigued they like today maybe they want you to do stuff so they can go do something else how should they reach out to you sir? well there's not much to do today but nonetheless if you do want me to do stuff feel free to contact me through my website stcharleswealth.com um I've been in the business for over 10 years as an independent. Uh, I really enjoy the option trading side of it. So if you would like to have an advisor that uh, uh, checks those boxes, feel free to contact me. There you go. stcharleswealth.com is the place to go. And if you also want places to go, maybe to talk about options throughout the day, maybe to have someone help you, guide you, maybe even to read a newsletter or two about such things as volatility, maybe the land of the pit is the place you want to go. Mr. Rock Lobster, what will they find if they go there? Um, go to our fall newsletter, go to, uh, our silver course, uh, our pro chat room, any of those stuff. If you, if you want all day long talking about options in a way that is, um, where guys are trading all day long. Um, it's not some crazy chat room. It is like just guys grinding it already, trying to make money. Uh, very knowledgeable room. Come check us out. Send me a note, Andrew at option pit.com. We'll introduce you to our pro chat room if you'd like. Um, just lots of learning and how options trade. Well, it is a crazy chat room, but, it, but it's the good kind of crazy. It's the fun crazy. It's the crazy. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's why I call them the pit crazies over there. If you want to join them for yourself, optionpit.com is the place to go. I've met a few of them now over the years. They mostly seem pretty nice. <laughs> Don't hold the rock lobster against them. That's, that's not their fault. Uh, optionpit.com is the place to go. If you want the rock lobster on your phone, all day, not, not just on the phone when you listen to this show, but maybe you want them to text you. There you go. Optionbit.com, you can sign up for that silver course. We'll be texting you throughout the day. So make for that what you will. Maybe that's exciting to you. That's the case in Optionbit.com. And our last but not least, the last emperor, he, he probably won't text you. I don't know. Maybe Fidelity will do that. I don't know. But he won't charge any commissions to trade. That's pretty cool. Mr. Last Emperor, if they head on over to Fidelity.com slash options, what will they find, sir? Uh, yeah, fidelity.com forward slash options uh, to open an account, apply for options trading. Um, I would say not only the differentiating factor that we are zero commissions like everyone else, but uh, maybe some of the best uh, execution quality of uh, routing your orders to appropriate places uh, with you know your particular interests in mind as clients. Uh, this is the place to be. Uh, my name is Constantine. You can reach out. I can't text you, but I can definitely uh, speak with you on the phone if you're a client already. We could uh, email back and forth as well. I uh, also could go to fidelity.com forward slash coaching to, uh, to see us in the uh, educational classes that we do on a daily basis. There you go. Call them up. Ask for the last emperor. They'll know who you're talking about because he's the last one. He's the only one they got. Fidelity.com slash options. And that's a good point. You know, that now we're in – the game is really afoot now in the brokerage space because we've kind of moved past the surface level, the surface pain point everyone had with commissions. Now it's all about the really important stuff. You're right. The execution. It's about the tools. It's about the platform. It's about the customer service. A lot of the other things that are equal to, if not more important, than the actual commissions. And so everyone was so focused on commissions. Now that barrier has been removed. So you guys can focus on the important stuff. Maybe you want to head over to Fidelity.com slash options. Kick the tires for yourself if you have a question. Call up the last emperor and the rest of the crew. There, they'll be happy 
to talk to you. And on behalf of The Last Emperor and Uncle Mike and The Rock Lobster or The Cold War Lobster, whatever you want to call them, and D myself. I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, and subscribing. If you want some more in your veins, maybe on the crypto side of the space, stay tuned. We'll be back in about exactly an hour with the folks from Ledger X. And if you know anything about them, they're, they're not exactly shy about expressing an opinion or two about things that are quite divisive. So uh, stay tuned for that. We'll be back in exactly an hour for that. You can listen to this on whatever device you're listening to this now. Just hit the next button, and you should be good to go. Otherwise, we'll see you back here on Thursday for more of the Option Block. The Option Block is brought to you by Fidelity Investments. Fidelity's Option Trade Builder tool can help you confidently build an options trade in three simple steps. Just choose a strategy, select a contract, and then review the benefits and risks of the trade. Learn more about Option Trade Builder at fidelity.com backslash options. Options trading entails significant risk and is not appropriate for all investors. Certain complex option strategies carry additional risk. Before trading options, contact Fidelity Investments by calling 800-544-5115 to receive a copy of the characteristics and risks of standardized options. Fidelity Brokerage Services, LLC, member NYSC SIPC. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at twitter.com slash options, stocktwits.com slash options, facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider dot com. 